Welcome back to another Mech Tech Tech. Today we have the third upgrade guide for Murders at Karlov Manor featuring Blame Game. Blame Game is a Boros deck focused on the goad mechanic with a little bit of suspect support on top. As always, we're going to swap out 10 cards without touching the lands because uh, those kind of changes really boring. The deck has Nelly Borga, Impulsive Accuser, as the commander out of the box, and we aren't going to make changes to that. Nelly is a Vigilant 2-4 that is looking to attack on every turn in order to suspect a creature, which serves two purposes. First, the suspected creature can't block and leaves our opponents open not only for Nelly to kind of get through, but, um, you know, all of our other creatures to get through, all of our opponent's creatures to get through. Uh, so we're really just, we're lowering those walls. And in addition to that, Nelly is going to then goad every suspected creature. Ensuring that we're not getting hit with any crackback. She also has some card draw tacked on as well, letting us keep our hand full at all times. So, what cards are we cutting to make room for a little bit of higher synergy? Kind of upping the power level of this deck. We're starting off with Boros Reckoner, a 3-3 three, three for 3 that could deal damage back to a target whenever it takes damage. I think that this deck is going to consistently have all of our opponent's creatures goaded, leaving very few sources to reflect back on our opponents, making the Reckoner just a not great fit for the deck. It is worth noting, if you could make this bad boy indestructible or something like that, you know, much higher value, but still not a great fit for this deck. Let's move on, shall we? Darien, King of Kodor, is another creature that assumes our deck isn't doing what it's meant to and rewards us with some chump lockers as a constellation prize. Six mana for a 3-3 that makes us tokens after we've taken damage is far too slow for the aggression that this deck is trying to put out. Feather, Radiant Arbiter, is an interesting choice for this deck. We don't have a ton of non-creature spells that target, and the ones that we do, we generally don't want to target our own creatures. I imagine we're meant to use it with a goad spell that we're using to target our own Arbiter, and then pay two multiple times in order to hit multiple creatures with the goad, but I just don't personally see that as being very worth it. Again, we have a lot of ways to already goad multiple creatures, specifically our commander, but we have other ways of doing it as well, and this just feels like a weird kind of slow way of doing it, and again, we're looking for that speed. Havoc Eater is up next and is an easy cut for me. A 7 cost 3-3 three, three that requires decent creatures that aren't already goaded to bring real value to the field is just too expensive for me. Are there instances where this card could pop onto the field and be highly impactful as both a creature itself and is a powerful way to, like, go really big creatures? Sure, right? It could. Not denying it. But do I want to sit on a 7-drop in my hand waiting for that board state to come? I really don't. Kazul, Tyrant of the Cliffs, is another card that assumes we're failing to go the important and powerful creatures our opponents control. I really like them in my Ishin to Heavens as one deck, which doesn't rely on goading, but relies on just me kind of generating a lot of duders. But in this deck, you know, we're, we're goading our opponents, they're not really attacking us. Sure, having attacks on that as attacks in order to generate blockers when they fail isn't bad by any means, but I don't think it's as strong as we would like it to be. Ransom Note is once again being cut, it just really remains underwhelming for me. Surveil 1 on ETB is fine, but we aren't going to recur anything, so, you know, we need to be able to afford whatever it is we are throwing in that bin. It serves a minor purpose. In each of the pre-cons, right, it surveils for the surveil deck. It cloaks for the manifest, you know, kind of flip these cards face down to face up deck. It goes for this deck, and it draws for the clue deck, serving as a clue itself. All this is nice, but I really just don't feel like Ransom Note is as strong as I would like it to be. Savine's Reclamation is a slow way to cheat out a cheap thing from our grave, too, if we had flashed it back. But honestly, we don't have a ton of 3 CMC or less permanents that we're dying to keep out in the field, making it a pretty safe cut in my mind. Stalking Leonin is a bit of a rougher cut in my mind. Uh, the fact that it could be removed, making the removal that we've prepped kind of like a waste, it doesn't really do anything. 
I think this deck paints a pretty big target on our back for removal pieces. You know, forcing a lot of game actions that our opponents might not want to take is going to lead to them wanting to tear down your walls so that you stop doing it. The fact that Stalking Leonin needs to be on the field when we're attacked to reveal is like the biggest downside of my mind. I feel like if it was one effect and not two separate, it'd be much stronger, but it's two different effects, I'm just not feeling it. Vow of Duty is an interesting enchantment, but makes sense as a cut for a few reasons. First and foremost, not goading a creature, right? So our opponent could just hold this guy up as a beefy blocker if they wanted to. Secondly, the creature becomes vigilant, meaning even if they do attack, guess what? Still a blocker for them. Sure can't attack us, but it's still allowed to block our creatures. Last up is Winds of Wrath, which destroys all creatures that aren't enchanted, and we're only looking to enchant our opponent's creatures in this deck, meaning that we're wiping our own field. And letting our opponent's likely beefed up goaded creatures live, and it really feels like a non-bow in this deck. But with those 10 cards out, what are we adding back into the deck in order to beef it up? Popular Entertainer is first up and gives our commander an added ability that when we damage a player with one or more creatures, we get to go to a creature that they control. All we need to do is have a single creature get through and with a number of flying creatures in the deck, it's a nice source of some extra temporary goad for us. Moving up into our sorceries, we have Taunt from the Rampart, which serves two purposes. First being that we're goading all creatures our opponents control, meaning that we're safe from crackback for at least a turn. Secondly, those creatures cannot block. So we should see everyone's life fall and fall fast, leaving us to clean up any stragglers on the following turn. Slicer Hired Muscle is up next and is looking for us to pass him around the table as a double striking 3-4 that's goaded. We're aiming to have that, you know, that Slicer deal 6 damage to each opponent. And if that happens to fail and they have blockers, odds are 6 damage to a blocker is going to remove it. Ideally, Slicer lives through that damage, but if not, he still served his purpose. Following up the Hired Muscle is Nils, Discipline Enforcer. They're going to pass out power to our opponents, taxing that power in order for them to attack us. Those creatures are also pretty likely to be goaded, so the tax is really just icing on the cake as we force our opponents to pound each other into the ground for us. Karlak, Fury of Avernus, is up next and is giving us some extra combats, which is going to push our commander to suspect two creatures per turn instead of just one. Doubling those triggers is definitely going to speed up the game tremendously for us. After Karlak, we have Grenzo Havoc Razor, a versatile card that is either upping our goad game or stealing cards from our opponents. And while it's definitely here for that goat effect, if they happen to have just tutored, scribed, or surveilled a card to the top of the deck, it could be worth stealing. Up next, we have Bothersome Quasit to increase our good potential even further, but more importantly, in my mind, makes it so that goaded creatures cannot block. Sure, the suspect mechanic attached to our commander already makes it so they can't block, but we do have other ways of goading creatures, and we want to be able to make sure that our path is always clear, right? I don't want anything in my way, I'm just coming in to punch you in the face, I'm doing red boy stompy things, like, here we come. Aroya, the law above, is here to draw us cards on everyone's turn, and eventually sling some free damage to boot. All that tied to an evasive 4 for our body is really icing on the cake, and the fact that we can bring them out to turn after our commander lets us, you know, really step on that gas super early. Argus, Koss, Spirit of Justice serves two purposes. Right, so it's going to suspect a creature on ETB and on attack, which is strong with our commander in the early game. Because every time our commander attacks, we're goading all suspected creatures, right? Not just the one that they happen to have just suspected themselves. But in the late game, right, if there's a powerful effect that's just being persistent on a creature that's been suspected, it's just not dying. On attack, we could just be like, oh cool. That thing's exiled. Get it out of here. Last up, in our golden nightmare of the deck, it's Delny Streetwise Lookout. The first ability will ensure that our commander isn't likely dying on attack should an opponent have a bunch of BP blockers up. 
but more important is that second ability which is going to double up the trigger of our commander, as well as a few other key creatures in the deck. Doubling up really just allows us to suspect a second creature. Uh, goading two creatures every turn on attack is great. This is particularly true if we have Karlak out. You know, now we're goading four creatures a turn with our commander alone. You know, if we have our Spirit of Justice out, cool. He's also two power or less, meaning that we're going to now go from goading four in this ideal scenario to goading eight. Really can't be understated just how much Downey Streetwise Lookout is like pumping up the power of this deck. Although that is the deck, we do have a few honorable mentions that were a little costly in terms of uh, hitting your pocketbook to pick up, but would make fun additions if you already have them or just have the funds available. Starting off, we have Bayloth, Baratil, Entertainer, to keep your opponent's creatures goaded. As they are naturally, you're really gonna only fend off basically tiny little token decks, but like, token decks' ability to swarm and overwhelm you, you know, being able to keep them at bay with him, still pretty good. But we do have a few cards in the deck that kind of pass out power to each player. And if we're putting that power onto our entertainer, you know, we're going to keep more and more creatures goaded with him. Iroa's God of Victory is going to give all of our creatures a little bit of evasion with that menace, but more importantly, prevents combat damage to our attacking creatures. So, you know, we're not worried about Death Touch. We're really ensuring that all of our creatures get to live, and a lot of them have effects that happen on attack, so we're, we're keeping them alive to trigger repeatedly. Speaking of repeated triggers, Roaming Throne is here as another trigger doubler. Uh, this deck definitely is not a kindred focus deck, but if you choose Detective, you know, our Spirit of Justice and our Commander are both Detectives, so we really get to up our Suspect game and go to even more creatures. You know, that being said, is Roaming Throne worth it? for two creatures in the deck. Kind of up to you, but like, maybe? Kind of hard to say. Last up is Akroma's Will, which is a game ender in my experience. Your creatures are generally unblockable whenever you have your commander out with this because they're gonna get, you know, all of the effects. So pro, all colors, like, maybe you're facing someone that has an artifact creature deck and, like, they can do something, but you also have flying. So unless they specifically have, like, a bunch of Thopters or, like, some flying artifact creatures that are specifically colorless, you're really getting through. The double strike in Vigilance means that we're dealing extra damage, we're maintaining blockers for ourselves should we not have, you know, goaded everything that we need to. The lifelink and indestructible is also nice. Um, indestructible to avoid board wipes, right? With all of our opponents attacking each other and us kind of steamrolling, they're gonna want to wipe our board, and this is a way around it. Not the ideal way to use it, but definitely a haha, I'm actually safe. Uh, and the lifelink really just, you know, puts an extra cushion between you and that. That's the guide. If you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing for more deck techs and eventually some gameplay. Uh, like the video if you liked it. Let me know if there's a commander you'd like to see a custom build for in the comments section down below. If you want to nerd out about magic, anime, and games in general, feel free to join the Discord. But until next time, good luck with your builds.